All right, my friends. Well, I am glad to be back with you. Um, before we jump into our uh, survey of the book of Revelation, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, I, I just thank you for who you are, God, and I thank you, Lord, that you enable us, and even perhaps particularly through Revelation, you show us that we can be confident in the fact that you reign over all this earth. And so, Lord, as our nation continues this election process, as in so many ways uh, it feels perhaps as if our nation is raging, and indeed uh, that this process may continue for some time, I pray, God, that you remind us of the fact that we are first and foremost citizens of a kingdom that will never be shaken and that will endure for all eternity. So, Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for us in Christ. I pray that you continue to help us to be uh, confident in that reality, that we might live as faithful witnesses to you in this world. And it's in Christ's precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. All right. So last week we discussed the bowl of the, or I'm sorry, the judgments of the bulls, um, where now with 144,000 martyrs having been killed, angels are shown coming from the temple and they receive bowls um, which are filled with the passion of God, the wrath of God, which are to be poured out in uh, kind of the final judgment that we have been waiting for. When, when these bowls have been poured out in full, the wrath of God will be complete. These bowls, again, are the, the, the final uh, third of a, a cycle of threes, which began with the seals, then the trumpets, and now culminates finally with the bowls. Um, each of these sequences covered the same relative time frame, the same relative events surrounding the destruction of Israel and uh, of, of Jerusalem as a result of God's judgment upon the people. Um, but it showed the, these events from very various different vantage points, various different theological fr uh, frame of references, uh, and it, it, it unveiled what was happening over time. And we're going to see some pretty remarkable revelations today as well as John moves forward and we begin to see some things with greater specificity. Um, the bowls that we, we saw last week proceeded this way. The first bowl was poured out upon the earth and it affected all of the people who had worshipped the beast and had taken his mark, where their skin breaks out in boils and sores and blisters. The second bowl was poured into the sea and John says that it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing in the sea died. You'll remember that previously the seals only affected one-fourth, the trumpets only affected one-third, but now the, the, the bowls affect 100% of whatever uh, it is poured upon. The judgments have been intensified. This is the complete judgment that we are witnessing. So now every living thing in the sea dies. And it's, a, it's not just blood, it's the blood of a corpse. It's coagulated blood. Three, the third bowl is poured into the rivers and springs. Again, this is following the pattern that we have come to expect that begins with the land, then the sea, then the fresh waters, and then the heavens. Um, and so it, in the, this, this third bowl is poured upon the rivers of springs, and they too become as blood. And an angel declares that God is good and just for making the people who killed the saints and the holy martyrs, that God is just for making them drink the very blood that they have spilled. So the waters becoming as blood is this idea that God is, God is revealing what has already occurred. He makes it visible, right? That now even the water turns to blood and they are guilty of spilling innocent blood. And an angel cries out, God, you are just because you have given them what they deserve to drink. That is the blood of the martyrs. Now, the fourth bowl, again, following the pattern that we would expect, is poured upon the sun, and it is allowed to scorch the people um, who have taken the mark of the beast with fire. It's a companion to that plague of blisters, right, that the sun now is scorching the people, and we talked last week about how that is exactly the opposite of the promises that Jesus has given to the saints, even within the book of Revelation, that those who follow Christ, the sun will not scorch them, that the, the element 
elements. They're protected from the elements because of the fact that God is among them and in their midst. And yet in this plague, we see that the sun is allowed to scorch the people with fire and cause these blisters. Now, the fifth bowl is, is right the opposite, that this fifth bowl is poured upon the beast's throne. Now, if you remember again, we talked last week that um, when the dragon, when Satan is cast from heaven after Jesus ascends, it says when he calls up this beast from the sea, it says that Satan gives to him his throne and his authority. And so when it is referring to the, the throne here, that it's poured upon the beast's throne, it's referring to the Roman Empire, that it is covered in darkness and thrown into abject chaos. So in, in an effect, John dramatically shows on the one hand that they are scorched by the day. It's too much for them. It causes blisters. It harms them. Um, and now they, are, they also conversely are thrown into abject darkness as well. <clears throat> Two things which the church is protected from because the church, on the other hand, sees truly because they listen to Jesus' voice. Now, we left off with the sixth bull, um, and uh, I want to, to begin by reading that again so that we can cover a few of the themes that we only introduced last week. So let's begin um, and reading with, uh, with Revelation 16, starting with verse 12. Uh, and I will include the, the verses that I'm reading uh, in a PDF on the video description below the video. I wasn't able to put together a slideshow today. Apologies for that. But the, the verses themselves will be available to you um, online. All right, Revelation 16, beginning with verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the, the whole world, the oikumene, to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty." Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. With the bull poured into the Euphrates, the river is made dry, uh, much like the Red Sea was when the Israelites cross over the Red Sea on dry ground. Or I believe precisely what John is attempting to remind them of is the fact that uh, this is a reference to Joshua, that when they pass finally into the Holy Land, God does the very same thing with the river Jericho, that it causes the water to dry up so that they would pass over it on dry ground into the holy land that God had given unto them that they were going to conquer um, because God had determined that it would be their land. And this uh, is very much related to that reality. Um, this drying up of the river is said to prepare the way for the kings from the east, which literally is the kings from the rising sun. With the devil's dominion now in darkness, and because of this very clear Joshua imagery of crossing into the Holy Land on dry ground, these kings of the rising sun refer to God's army itself, not those who are allied with the dragon or with the beast who are in darkness at this point. Jesus, whose name is Joshua, the original pronunciation of Jesus, his name, as he would have been heard among his people, they would have thought Joshua, Jesus, who is named after Joshua and came into the Holy Land to conquer it and establish the kingdom, is now doing so in full. And it will be done in full when his judgment falls upon Jer Jerusalem in its entirety. To meet the armies of the Lord, the devil and the beast and the land beast who is now called the fa false prophet, they deceive the entire world. It says the whole oikumene, that is the economy of Rome, the Roman Empire, again, this is not the entire world, right? There is no one from South America involved in this. Um, it's referring to the Roman Empire, their world as such. Uh, and all, the whole world is deceived through these frog-like demons that come from 
from the mouth. Uh, and they bring individuals from all nations to join in their armies, which would ultimately, uh, was ultimately summoned to Megiddo. But why do the armies assemble at a place that he says in Hebrew is Armageddon? Armageddon simply means the mountain or the hill of Megiddo. And Megiddo simply means assembly. It's the mountain of assembly. The, the word Megiddo etymologically uh, carries kind of the connotation of exposure by cutting. Right? It's, the, it's the appointed place, the assembled place where the truth would be laid bare. And Megiddo is significant in, Israel, his, in Israel's history. One of the most important events that occurred at Megiddo was the death of King Josiah, who, if you recall from the Old Testament, was one of the uh, only righteous kings of Israel's history, that he was responsible for turning the people back uh, uh, where they, they find the book of the law and they return and repent with sackcloth and ashes, and he leads them uh, to into faithfulness where they abolish the altars of Baal and of Asherah and all the idolatry that was going on. King Josiah was a good and a righteous king. Um, and he was also killed at a battle at Megiddo. And so because of this, um, Megiddo is a place that was always associated with mourning and with disaster for the people of Israel because it was a place where their good and their righteous king had died. It was the place where they discover that the worst has happened and that indeed their true king, their rightful king, had been killed. Jeremiah 22 includes a very uh, significant uh, and beautiful lament for King Josiah because of how righteous he was um, and how faithful he was and declares that Megiddo will always be a place of mourning. And I believe that this is the, primarily the purpose for John saying that all of the armies gather there, not so much that it is a uh, that, that Megiddo itself is going to be the place specifically of battle, but rather that, Meg this, that, that, that the, the destruction that comes as judgment from God as a result of their covenant breaking is going to be uh, and produce a mourning precisely like what they experienced at Megiddo. And I think that, that uh, the, the, the prophet Zechariah helps us here. And, you know, we know that, of course, that the, the, the battle in the first century, it, it ravaged the entire land of Israel. It was not simply at, uh, focused at a battle at Megiddo. So we know that the, the historic circumstances are much broader than this might lead us to believe. But Zechariah helps us here. This is Zechariah 12, verses 10 through 14. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each tribe by itself with their wives by themselves, the tribe of the house of David and their wives, the tribe of the house of Nathan and their wives, the tribe of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shammai and their wives, and all the rest of the tribes and their wives. He's saying, just as Megiddo was a place of mourning before, so too will Jerusalem weep and all the tribes will weep when they behold the one that they have pierced. I believe that this is precisely what Jesus meant when he said that they would see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, as he says in Matthew 24. Um, he's speaking of this. This is not simply discussing the idea that every tribe of the world will mourn, but know that every tribe of Israel is going to mourn as if they've lost a firstborn, because they are going to understand in the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century, that Jesus was who he said he was. And that indeed, as Peter says in Acts 2, that this one whom you killed, God has made him to be Christ and Lord. It is a demonstration that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And because this judgment is falling, everyone will see and be absolutely certain that who is the true king, even though they had killed him, but that lamb now reigns. As John says, Revelation 1-7, which is, I said, the theme verse of this entire book, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and the tribes of the land will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. The lamb who was slain reigns and he is now gathering his armies uh, to come against the beast and all the tribes will mourn in Jerusalem and throughout all Israel, even as they once mourned at the plain of Megiddo. Now, that's an interesting point because that passage in Zechariah specifically says the plain of Megiddo, but John says the mountain of Megiddo. It's Armageddon. It's the Mount of Megiddo. But in Megiddo, there actually is no mountain. It is, in fact, a plain. And so to refer to this place as, a, uh, as the mountain of Megiddo is a bit confusing, which is why I think we likewise need to always return. John is, is weaving together biblical symbolism. He's weaving it together. This is not in any sense, uh, uh, he is not playing by the rules that we would expect him to play by if he was simply describing a historic narrative. He's not doing pure history. He is weaving together theological themes from the Old Testament as, as if he's creating a collage or a tapestry um, to show them what was occurring in the geopolitical manifestations of their time, that God himself was actually bringing this about. Um, and so in any case, um, we need to consider the context. Um, in Scripture, Mountains are always significant. Mountains are always seen as sort of intermediary places where the heavens and the earth meet, which is, of course, you know, on account you go up higher, you're, of course, closer to the heavens. This is another reason why trees are always associated as sort of this, like, bridge between heaven and earth. Mountains function in a similar way, and we see that God meets his people on Mount Sinai um, when he gives the covenant. Um, um, the mountain is significant. This is why they worshiped on high places, because they sought, to, they sought mountains to build their temples. And Elijah, I think significantly, he battles the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, which is the closest mountain to Megiddo. And this is, of course, a battle between gods as well. It is Satan, the dragon, who seeks to deify himself and destroy the sun, um, who, who causes the beast um, to, to, to rise from the sea and who causes a false prophet to rise in the land and to turn all people to worship. Satan is an idolatrous deity indeed. Um, and it is a battle between him and his forces and the one true God, the lamb who was slain. Um, Importantly, uh, there is another thematic connection between Elijah and this battle at Mount Carmel, which again was the closest mountain to Armageddon, uh, is that when Elijah made war on the prophets of Baal and defeated them, the reason that the prophets of Baal were in the land and had become such a significant problem is that there was a wicked and an adulterous woman, a false prophet named Jezebel who with her king, or with her husband, the king, King Ahab, they turned the entire nation to idolatry. And it was as a result of this wicked and evil woman that the entire land was polluted uh, and that, that war had to be waged. A wicked harlot queen leads the people astray in that day. And now John is preparing to introduce us to the same kind of figure, um, the new harlot, the queen of all harlots. Um, and we will see her in a moment. Now, in this section, we don't actually see the Battle of Armageddon because that is going to be shown in greater detail in Revelation 19. But the scene is ultimately set. This is where the final battle will occur. Um, thematically, not historically. Historically, it, it ends in Jerusalem. Thematically, Jerusalem, they will mourn of Jerusalem as they did Megiddo. Um, but the scene has been set. Now, let's look at the final bull, which is in Revelation 16, starting with verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bull into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. 
And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there has never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no, mountain were, no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, the size of a talent each, about a hundred pounds, fell from heaven on the people, and they cursed God for the plague of hail, because the plague was so severe. Here, finally, we come to the culminating judgment poured out upon the great city, which we were first introduced in chapter 11. The great city where the two witnesses who represented all the martyrs were killed. The great city, we are told, that was spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. In chapter 14, when, when we are shown these 144,000 martyrs who are reaped, and it says that they, they, like grapes, are put into the winepress of God's wrath and their blood is poured out upon the land. Remember, the 1600 stadia. Where did, the blood, where did it say that the blood was poured out? It said that the blood was poured out just outside the city of Jerusalem. It was poured out at the same location of Jesus' own crucifixion. So now the blood of Christ poured out upon the land is mixed with all the blood of the martyrs, and that blood covers the entire land of Egypt. Um, it is Golgotha is that location just outside the city. And now that same great city we were introduced to reaps the final judgment. It is burned and it is pummeled with hailstones about 100 pounds each. This passage is parallel to the final passage of the seals and the trumpets. You'll remember where it says that there were loud rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Um, from the very beginning in Revelation 4, where we're shown the throne, where there's flashes of lightning and rumblings, it's to remind you that, that God is on the throne, that this is from God's throne. And each and every time we see it, it gets more significant, more intense. Just as the judgments get more intense, so too does this even though it is parallel. Now, here we see it is, it is the final iteration. Now, a voice that came from the throne, this is the Father himself, he says, it is done. And then flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, the likes of which has never been seen, which splits the city into three parts. There are substantial historic references here. We previously read about the, uh, the circumstances of the city of Jerusalem during the final six months, the final siege, um, which it was just an abject horror to live in Jerusalem with the famine so great that people were subjected to, to barbarous torture and just vile mistreatment as folks were so starving that they were willing to do anything in order to secure some kind of food. Um, it was so bad, even Titus, the Roman general who was destroying the city. I mean, amazing. Think of this. He was uh, so un amazed at how wicked and awful the people had become within the city that he actually wanted the siege to end so that he could begin rescuing people out of the city because the circumstances had been so terrible. And that was in large part because there was a massive civil war happening inside Jerusalem, inside the city walls, as they are besieged by the Romans. And it was a battle that was waged by three specific factions. The earthquake rumbles and it splits the city in three. And I believe this is what it is referring to. You have uh, Eleazar, who was the head, the leader of the Zealots. You have John of Gishala, who was the leader of Gal the Galileans. And you have Simon, who was over the Idumeans, who also had moved in uh, previously. These factions were warring throughout the city, trying to seize control. And each of them had their own various goals and political views. 
The brutal infighting within the city was a major cause of its downfall, where, I mean, you have uh, food being burned, you have all kinds of food being stolen. I mean, you just have such vile mistreatment that, um, you know, if the people were actually unified, you know, they wouldn't have been able to ultimately withstand the Romans. But, I mean, it was ultimately they fell upon themselves as if wild beasts. We've talked about this previously. But there was, of course, more. In this passage, it says, God remembered Babylon the great and made her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Babylon is the city that must drink her cup in full. God is finally pouring out the wrath that Christ promised to the Pharisees when he said, fill up the measure of your fathers. Right? When he said it will fall on this generation. You know, indeed, it's, it's wild. Josephus, in his Wars of the Jews, he even says that the temple, when it finally was burned, it actually was lit ultimately by those living inside Jerusalem. That as a result of their own infighting, the flames of this spread and the temple itself went up in smoke. And it is the Jews had, in, a, in effect, become like Babylon who had burned the temple originally when they came to destroy the temple. And now the Jews, who, who John is calling Babylon, they burn the temple as well. But all of this is the result of a final covenant judgment. God said that when he had made covenant with the people, if they reject God in the fullest sense, that they would be stoned with hail, um, with a sevenfold judgment. Adulterers, we know and we've discussed, must be stoned. Adulterous daughters of priests must be stoned and burned, and all of these judgments fall upon Jerusalem. And I think most so amazingly, Josephus tells us in, in Wars 5, 6, 3, that the 10th legion began launching stones from their catapults, which were of a white color and were the weight of a talent. John tells us that this judgment finally upon the city would be because hailstones the size of a talent, about 100 pounds, uh, depending on your translation, um, because God flung those upon the city, and that is precisely what the Romans used in order to bombard the city. The Roman bombardment looks exactly like this. And this is the end of the world. Make no mistake. This is the end of the world. It was not the end of the world as such, right? The world has continued. But it was the end of the world of the old covenant. It was the end of physical Israel as a people of God, as a covenant people. Um, it was the end of the false temple. It is the stoning of the adulterous covenant people who are cast off. It was the sign that Jesus has now become king in the heavens. That Jesus indeed was the refining fire that came to burn the chaff with his winnowing fork in his hand. Uh, to come in judgment against those who killed him and to vindicate those who have killed his followers. Such that every tribe in the land would wail. And I mean, it's almost, gr I mean, it's grievous even to think about it. They, are all, they still are wailing. They are still wailing in Jerusalem today, just as Jesus said that they would, that the abject destruction of the city is the sign that the lamb who was slain is in fact the one that reigns and that his martyrs had been vindicated. Don't forget when we, I've mentioned this before at some point, but when the hailstones are being thrown down, that also should signal to us something significant has happened in the heavens. The heavens are opening up. Remember, the temple has opened and you see angels coming forth. But if hailstone is, hailstones are falling, that means that the firmament itself is actually crashing down. The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of God. That's actually what, is ha what happens with the trumpets. That is what is happening here. And we are going to see the, the heavens descending, crashing through the firmament until at the conclusion of this book, the heavens and the earth are one as God intended from the very beginning. And so these hailstones are a symbol exactly of that. Heaven is crashing through uh, and it brings the destruction of the old as a result. 
When the city falls, just as Jesus said concerning the atonement, when he said it is finished, um, so too we now see God the Father say the same thing concerning his wrath. It is done. The old covenant, which Hebrews tells us was obsolete and ready to vanish, has now been destroyed permanently. Okay, um, in conclusion, I want to I wanna read for you uh, the first few verses from 17. Um, we'll go into this in greater detail um, in next week. Um, but... Uh, now that we ha- we've seen the bull judgments kind of in full, where it gives all of these things in summary, and it re- do- does it fairly quickly. There's not near as much detail as previous examples, as I said last week. Um, but now in the next chapters, we're going to see all those things in, in much greater detail. So let's read Revelation 17, and we'll see this. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth had committed sexual immorality, and with the the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, And it had seven heads and horns, and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. So John is now invited after seeing everything in summary to come. And now I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. Quickly, I want to read just a piece from Jeremiah 3. I know it's a lot of reading because I think this is important because to me, this really seals the connection, the thematic connection that John is trying to make here in Revelation between Josiah and this Megiddo reference that we just described. Jeremiah in chapter 3, he describes the land as being polluted by Israel's harlotry where he says, you have defiled the land with your uh, your prostitution and wickedness. Therefore, the rain, the showers have been withheld and no spring rains have fallen. Yet you have the brazen look of a prostitute. This actually says literally that you have a prostitute's forehead. There's a sign on her forehead. You have a harlot's forehead. You refuse to blush with shame. During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and committed adultery there. I gave faithless Israel her divorce certificate and sent her away because of all her adulteries. When Israel was first destroyed, God speaks of it as being a divorce decree because Israel had given itself to harlotry. Israel, who had the sign, the look of a harlot on her forehead and who pollutes the entire land with her adulterous evil. And this is what has happened. Israel has become as wicked now like Babylon with the sign on her forehead, which says Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. And this woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of all the martyrs. She is the mother of all harlotry. She, which direct, is directly connected to the blood. The abomination of desolation is not uh, anything other than the spilling of the martyr blood, which pollutes and, and, and profanes the entire land, crying out for judgment. She is drunk on the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, and now she will be judged for shedding that very same blood. 
Now, some have attempted to suggest that Babylon is Rome, uh, and there's reasons to think that, but I believe that they miss something quite key in Revelation 18, referring to this woman, when it says, in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and all who had been slain on the land. For those who try to argue that Babylon is Rome, uh, because Rome killed the saints, they fail to see Rome never was guilty for killing any of Israel's prophets. However, however, this very much is connected to what the Lord Jesus himself said specifically about what those in the land do. The entire land of Israel is covered with martyr blood that was poured out in the exact location that Jesus was killed in a city that's been called Sodom in Egypt where the Lord was crucified. Only Israel ever kills the prophets, right? Do you remember? I sent you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you killed, some whom you crucified, so that upon you would come all the righteous blood shed on the land from Abel to Zechariah, whom you killed between the altar and the sanctuary. I tell you, it will come upon this generation. Right? I mean, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, how I long to gather you. But you were unwilling See, your house is left to you desolate. This can only be referring to Israel. Only Israel is guilty of these crimes. And yes, Rome was most certainly involved, right? I mean, Peter says in Acts 2 that the Jews killed Jesus by the hands of lawless men. That in some sense, the Jews were fundamentally guilty for that because they are the ones who delivered Jesus over and who pushed for his execution. So he says, you killed him through hum- the, the use of lawless hands. They use the Romans like a weapon. And until this point, Rome has been fundamentally complicit in every single thing that Israel has done. But Israel bears the, fi- the fullest burden because they are doing it as covenant breakers. That They are doing it as a rejection of God in the flesh himself. So this woman, Babylon, is Israel become unfaithful. It is is Israel as an adulterer par excellence. She is the epitome of the wicked woman of Proverbs who's constantly tempting you into foolishness and deceitfulness. And unfortunately, the the people of God, uh, the physical descendants of Abraham, had become this in the first century when they rejected Christ Jesus. But indeed, as we're even talking about Rob's midweek series, all of us would be this harlot. Every single one of us would be this harlot were it not the grace of God to redeem, right? Paul says as much. He says, I wish I myself were cut off for the sake of my people, but he thanks God for the grace that he did not deserve as a blasphemer and a violent man himself, a persecutor of the church, the chief of all sinners, Right? God ha- saves his people and he's had so much grace indeed even on those who are Jewish. But this is uh, a judgment that is uh, truly tremendous um, and we would be part of it as well. But instead we're going to see the church emerge, the new Jerusalem, the spotless bride who replaces the adulterous woman. When I saw her, I greatly marveled, John says, I believe that John is shocked specifically because the Babylonian harlot is unfaithful Israel, which I think he didn't quite understand until this point. Now it becomes clear because she's actually dressed as if she were a high priest. It is a blasphemy, just even the way that she looks. The priests had the name of God on their forehead as part of their ritual robes. Um, Their garment likewise had gold and it was made of threads of scarlet and purple and of blue. Blue, which was the rarest, most expensive color for dyeing fabrics. Um, The harlot does not have blue. She has become depraved. But the rest of the outfit she maintains. She appears to be a, a wicked high priest, an evil prophetess, a false prophetess who is leading all of the people astray. One fascinating piece of history, um, 
that I believe John may even be referencing here, mentioning the fabrics and these kinds of things. In the rebuilt temple, after they come back from Babylon, um, the temple that stood in Jesus' day, the curtain, uh, Josephus mentions this, and I believe Tacitus does also, um, it mentions that the silk of the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple was actually made by Babylonian silk. It was made by Babylonian thread. Uh, And I believe that that may even have been something that John uh, intends for us to notice here. Um, One final thing. John is carried, you see, by the Spirit to see the woman out in the wilderness. This is the second time we have heard this phrase. Um, first, John was in the spirit on Patmos. Then he was in the, carried in the spirit into the heavens. Now he is carried away in the spirit into the wilderness, which always is symbolic of sin and death. On the Day of Atonement, you remember, one of the lambs is slaughtered, the other one is sent into the wilderness. All the sins of the people carried away. So to go into the wilderness is to go into the place of death. And if you think about it, that's precisely what Jesus does when he comes. He, he goes constantly going to the desolate places. He's going out into the wilderness to pray. He's tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He goes, you know, we were, it was intended to be a garden, but it's become desolate, right? But Jesus, the second Adam, goes to the desolate places in order to make them green again. Um, but in any case... John, in this time, he is taken in the spirit to the wilderness, the desolate place. Um, And we are going to see once more he's taken in the spirit, but this time he will be taken to a great mountain and he will see uh, from that divine place, that where heaven and meets earth, that he is going to see then the emergence of the new Jerusalem, um, the Jerusalem above who Paul says is our mother In conclusion, I want you to just glance at, we'll look about this more next week, the beast that she is said to be riding upon. The beast is scarlet or red, much like a dragon, and he has seven heads and ten horns. This is the exact same description that we received when John first introduced the the beast from the sea. This is the Roman Empire. He looked like the dragon, and therefore he had seven heads and ten horns and ten diadems. The harlot Jerusalem is riding atop Rome to persecute the church. Um, You see always that that Jerusalem, that the authorities in Israel were constantly trying to work the pagan authorities into persecuting the church. We've seen various ways in Revelation where the blood in the land becomes also infects the the blood of the Gentiles. Um, They become stained with blood as well. Um, And in so many ways, Israel was being propped up by Roman power, by Roman kings. Um, that Israel was propped up in this way, supported in certain respects by the pagan rule, which is why they wanted to maintain the status quo. They did not want Christ to be acknowledged because if he was acknowledged as king, that meant that the Romans would come and take their place. But in judgment for killing Jesus, they experience precisely what they fear because Jesus is now king. And as a result, he is bringing judgment here and the stability is destroyed. The judgment of the This adulterous woman happens precisely in this fashion when later in this very chapter 17 verses 15 through 17 he says when all the nations and the beast will hate the prostitute they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her with fire for God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Unfaithful Israel is going to fall by divine design and by divine decree when the Roman beast who Jerusalem would be riding, who Babylon is riding, when the beast and the nations of the world are going to turn against her, which we're going to see uh, in greater detail, which we will discuss next week. All right, um, let us pray as we leave. 
Lord, again, I just pray that you will remind us with that phrase, it is finished and it is done. Uh, And above all else, God, this week, would you remind us that we live as strangers in this land, in the midst of the political crises and the, the turmoil, God, as your people, we are uniquely able to be a people of peace. And you call us to be peacemakers where we go. Uh, and, and so, Lord, I pray that you would cause us to be those people, those peaceful people that seek to bring reconciliation, to join people, that we act as those who love our enemies, who pray for those who persecute us, who serve those who don't deserve it, um, or who would not treat us the same. We treat people as we would like to be treated, not how we think someone deserves. So, God, would you make us to be this people, that we would be your faithful witnesses, and witnesses crying out, come and, and have peace in Christ's name. We pray, amen.